Distribution provided by Cloud Sigma, the cloud that adapts to you. Visit cloudsigma.com slash this weekend for a free $200 credit. Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by New Relic. Use promo code TWIST and get a free month of New Relic Pro. To redeem, visit newrelic.com forward slash this weekend and see why thousands of developers worldwide don't deploy without it. And by SnapTerms, online legal protection made simple. Visit snapterms.com and enter the code TWIST to receive a free NDA with every order. Hey everybody, hey everybody, it's This Week in Startups. It's the last week of the year. I am 12 hours away from going away on my vacation and I've got two of the most amazing guests you could possibly have to recap the year. Rafe Needleman is with me, formerly of CNET, now working at the amazing Evernote and Robert Scoble. I need not introduce him, but you know what he does. He blogs, he video, he blah, 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 blah. Two really, really brilliant people. And Kieran Sasse is going to read the news. Stick with us. That's what it's all about, man. They said, money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like people until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. Hey everybody, hey everybody, I am Jason Calacanis and this is This Week in Startups and for the last three years I've been here talking to you guys about internet companies, technology and startups and entrepreneurship and it's our year end roundup, it's 2012, we're going to talk about the news this week and boy do we have an amazing, amazing uh, panel for you today, Rafe Needleman formerly of CNET, now with Evernote is going to be on the program, and so is Robert Scoble, uh, and Kieran's going to read the news. But before I do that, let me just take a moment. Uh, hey, speaking of Evernote, our friend uh, Phil Libin, uh, who has been on the show a couple times and is really a great, smart guy, and looks like he's losing a little bit of weight to me, um, is going to be at our live event, and I don't announce this on my Twitter, I just do it on the show for the real fans, but on uh, January 11th, right after CES, we're going to do our second private event, and boy, did the first one with Jeff Clavier go brilliantly. A hundred people showed up. Rocket Space put out beautiful wine and cheese and, like, little flags. Like, this is a blue cheese. This is a Rockford, and they had, like, the San Pellegrino. So good job, Rocket Space, on an amazing, amazing spread they put out. They were very gracious. And a packed crowd of great entrepreneurs on a Friday night uh, in San Francisco. And we had a wonderful time. Jeff Clavier brought the noise. He was just—he brought like incredible insights. It was like an incredibly great, great evening. It really supercharged me up to see all these super fans there, and they asked all these intelligent questions. So we're going to do it again. We're going to do it every month, I think. Uh, January 11th. It's very expensive to go, so most of you can't afford it. Uh, two dollars. It's a full two dollars uh, for my fans. Two dollars to go. Uh, and the reason we—why do we charge two dollars? Um, just because we want to put a little barrier there. You have to take your credit card out and type it in. Um, but we're going to make 200 bucks. So, hey, it's 200 beans. That's good. Put it on black. Um, thank you to my friends at Snap Terms for helping us create our legal terms of service. Um, and our legal terms of service um, is funny and informative. And if you don't have a terms of service, I don't know if you've been seeing this, but in the news, people without terms of services are getting sued. Or pe What the hell is Price doing in the background shot? Anyway, tons of uh, people are getting in trouble because I keep breaking my concentration. What the hell are you doing down there? There's no, we're not plugged in. My audio? No, your Mac. Oh, my Mac. Oh, don't worry about it. Anyway, listen. Snap Terms solves the problem. Instagram, all these people have problems with their terms of service. You need to have a terms of service. You need to have a privacy policy. Go to Snap Terms. Go to Snap Terms. Go to SnapTerms.com and save a ton of money doing it. You could hire an attorney and spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Or you can get your online legal protection made simple. You've seen this uh, featured all over the place, TechCrunch, Yahoo, et cetera, and uh, it's super effective. I give it my highest uh, um, recommendation. Go to th uh, thisweekend.com slash legal to see our terms of service, or just go to snapterms.com, and you can get started for only $149. You'll get a free NDA with every order, and who couldn't use one of those? Um, thanks again to our friends at Snap Terms for protecting our startups and... Um, you know, we really appreciate the support all year. Um, that's pretty funny. On their website, they have support and they put a jock strap. Hmm. These guys have a sense of humor. Uh, anyway, moving on. Uh, welcome back to the program, my good friend Rafe Needleman, who I've known for almost 20 years. How are you doing, Rafe? 
Good God, has it been that long? It's good to see you. It's good to see you, my good brother. Here. How are you enjoying getting out of journalism? And I owe you an email. Sorry I haven't gone back to you. I've been just crushed. No worries. Um, uh, you know... And now you're working at the amazing Evernote, which we're all in love with. Yeah, I know. Well, that's why I came here, right? Because we people we people are playing drinking games. Every time I mentioned Evernote on my podcast, you had to take a drink. People were getting sloshed. So I just thought I'd make it easy and <laughs> come here and come work here. And it's it's awesome. I love being on this side of the house and working on a project, a product that I'm just in love with. And I've loved the product for many years. So what is your title? Good. My title is Platform Advocate. Hmm, and like what I'm that. doing is is half uh, blogging about startups. So I still do on my Opportunity Notes blog, opnotes.com. Hmm. And uh, also, I'm an evangelist for the platform team, for the API, and mm. working with startups and getting them on board uh, as, as best I can uh, to do cool stuff with Evernote. Okay, and all, that's fantastic. Everybody go check out Evernote, and you can follow Rafe at R-A-F-E on Twitter. He's old school. He got at Rafe. Robert Scoble is back on the program. Robert, are you there? What's up? What's up, way? my brother? What's up? Ra Rafe can't pitch his own stuff because that's not allowed, but I love this. What? Community. You're not allowed? You should have told me that beforehand. Yeah, Evernote food. What the hell is that? It lets you ca uh -oh. capture everything you eat, everything you experience with food, and, uh, and put it into Evernote, baby. I so love it. I love it. And Robert, you do love food like me. You and I are both foodies. You can tell that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and you're, of course, in Half Boon Bay, fantastic Half, Boon, uh, Half Moon Bay uh, with the Ritz Carlton. Or is it, is the Ritz or the St. Regis where we got drunk? The Ritz. The Ritz. We right. went down to the Ritz. And That's started an drinking. expensive drinking. We started drinking it's double a, shots of McAllen or something. A was Diet it? Coke is six bucks, so you figure out what we spent. <laughs> God, I'm like, Robert, let me take you to dinner. Let me uh, have a couple of drinks with you. We go, and we're drinking double McAllen's? I don't know what it was, but, but by what, the fire pits. It was. Double I usually have Oban or a nice Ob wine there. I think we had an Oban and some cigars. It was a great time. It was a great time. Hey, let's get to the news. Kieran Kalia, the uh, whatever, what do, you, what do you want your title to be? What is your title again? She runs the launch conference for me now. All the you run all the editorial. Anything editorial. Anything editorial. This week in startups, the launch conference, launch ticker. Uh, what's the first story? All right. Well, you said you wanted to talk about your news uh, about this weekend. Yeah, sure. So why that's, something, about it. that's something. That's uh, something. We'll we'll get out of the way. So as as some folks know, you wrote a nice uh, editorial explaining you know moderate success is the enemy. Of yep. big success, and yep. you felt that this weekend had um, not gotten to anything beyond moderate success, yep. and it's really tough to make a business out of podcasting unless you can pull together some really amazing people like yourself and Kevin Rose and Adam Kroll. If you guys all had a network together, that would be a little bit different. Um, so you're shutting down the company, but you're going to keep doing this week in startups. Yeah, I, listen, we raised a little bit of money for the company, including yep. myself and a couple of my friends, and we still had most of that money in the bank, 50%, 60% of it. And we had gotten to break even, but we were sort of going sideways, as mm -hmm. you know. And getting a second or third or fourth podcast to break out, very hard for these networks. And I just thought to myself, my show is doing okay. Kevin, show, Kevin Pollock's show is doing mm -hmm. great. But, you know, really to get to scale, and, and that was the, the part of my piece that people didn't quite, you know, um, focus on to get. And I could have written it better, I guess. But for me, scale is building a $100 million plus company. To build a $100 million plus company, you're going to need to have 10, 15, 20, $25 million in revenue, right? And I think only a handful of people have ever made, made it to three, four, five million. I think Leo's at five million right now. That's after eight or nine years he's been doing this. Adam Carolla might be at a million. We're at 500, 600,000. So I just felt the podcasting space, although I think people are passionate about podcasting, I think it's a bit, I think it's a solo practitioner kind of thing where you'll have people who are just so good at it that they'll just have like a small company. And then really to get to scale, and I, you know, I'm not trying to merge with Leo's business, but I do think somebody should try to do a business. And I would obviously participate in it if they did. If somebody could corral five, 10 people with a half million, a million dollars in revenue, I would probably join some sort of consortium like that. But for now, I thought it was better for me in terms of the projects I have on my plate with the relaunch of Mahalo mm -hmm. as Inside.com with the launch conference doing well to focus on the winners and not try to well, force that issue. Robert Scoble, what do you think? Did I make the right call? Uh, I think so. I, you know, and I'm thinking if <clears throat> I had half a million dollars of revenue, I have enough to have a good lifestyle. It's a lifestyle business, right? So why do I need investment? Is taking investment going to help me scale my effort up? Not really, because the limiting factor here is attention, not money. And... Um, yeah, you could. Uh, what would you do? You would blow it all on advertising, trying to get a bigger audience. You know, right? Um, 
And it seems to it's me that podcast to think about reached... doing another Huffington Post or something like that. Maybe, you know, going back and looking at that model, she got three hundred million dollars when she sold. So yeah, but that but wasn't that... podcasting. You know, the thing with no. po- the thing is, if you change up the writers on the homepage of the Huffington Post, it keeps going. If you take Kevin Rose off Dig or Alex, it's over. If you take Leo off Twit, it's over. If you take Adam Carolla off of the Adam Carolla or Kevin Pollock off the Kevin Pollock podcast, they're over. And it's a distinctly different thing. <laughs> Rafe, did I make the right decision, or am I in it? No, I, I'm a big fan of lifestyle businesses. I would love to have one that generated 500k a year, but uh, turning that into a hundred million dollar business—that's a totally different animal. And I think you're right. I mean, if you want to do this for a living, great, do it. Go do it by yourself. If you want <clears> to have a giant media empire, you have to start a totally different company, and it's yeah. and it's hard. Podcasting, I know from experience, making money from podcasting, it's it's a total hit, hit business, and it's incredibly hard to find that hit. You got to cast a lot of stuff out there, and maybe one out of a million is going to work. You know. And look at look at CNET, right? They had um, yeah. uh, what was the Buzz show? Um, Buzz Out Loud. I was on that for a while. I you were on Buzz for, Out Loud uh, for a while, right? Year, so yeah. Buzz Out yeah. Loud to me seemed like the breakout. And then you had who was on it? Veronica at the peak. It was you, Veronica Belmont. Who else was on it? Molly Wood. Tom Aaron. Molly Wood. Tom. Yeah, there was a, we, it was a lot of fun. There were some good people on there. We had a really good, engaged daily audience. But Veronica left for Techzilla. Yeah. Tom mm-hmm. left to do the Tech News Daily with Leo. With, with Leo. And then it, it, nobody cares anymore, right? So you like you lose the team, it's over. It's like losing Howard Stern or something. So I just, it just felt like too hard of a business and too small of a reward for me. It, um, it's just, with video, it's very hard to get a large audience very quickly. Uh, you know, unless you do something sensational, like you're uh, doing Gangnam Style, kind of, you know, something that, that people just spread, uh, a GoPro kind of video or something. It's you know, I, I, I just cleaned up my YouTube uh, subscriptions and got went down from about 300 down to about 40. Hmm. And I watched each one. I went to each homepage and, and looked at the content again. The, the ability to get people to want to watch a, a, even a 10-minute video is very difficult. And the quality bar has gone up. You know, it's yep. not when I started... When I started doing videos at Microsoft with a $250 camera, we got to 4 million users a month. Uh, very, very quickly, uh, partly because we had exclusive access to something that was interesting already inside Microsoft, but partly because there was a hunger for new content. That does not exist right now. Uh, yeah. We have too much content, and so you know we're resistant to new new kinds of content coming along. It's, it's not something we're seeking out. So building a business in this space is, is going to be tough. It can be done if you have extraordinary content that punches through that noise stream, but it is tough. Yeah, and, and my point, you know, you know, Kieran works side by side with me every day, is you see how distracted I get by having so many different things on my plate. And this to me, it's yeah, ridiculous. and now it's so become much. like a consolidation play to me. It's like, okay, the best yeah. thing over here that was working was this week in startups and launch. Now that's, you know, essentially this week in startups I'll keep doing for 2013. It'll be part of launch. Four or five employees off to the side that I own 100% of. And, you know, it, it sort of runs itself now. The, and then the on the other side, I can focus I on this, inside. Yeah. The best advice I got this year was from an executive at uh, Red Bull, and he said, do fewer <clears throat> things better. Yeah, well, they and, did it with the jump, right? That's a $10 million video right there. What are you saying, Riff? No, I was just going to say that the thing about, as a media business, the thing about podcasting and videos that's really interesting online is that you have generally a really small audience, but they're highly engaged. I mean, people who watch this podcast or listen to, to any show, it, your fans are going to be with you for 10, 20, 30 minutes. And that's amazing. When you go to a website, you go to the Huffington Post or CNN or, or whatever, you're in and out in 90 seconds, if yeah. that. So it, it's quality versus quantity of engagement with the audience. But that's a really, really hard thing to sell to advertisers. Really hard. For yeah. low audience, high engagement. And we, and, nobody and, knows and, how to you know, sell that. And to Leo Laporte's credit, I, I think, you know, when he reads the ad, and we had some funny ad reads together for um, Audible back in the day, um, and obviously, you know, doing live ads were how t- television and radio started. You know, that model does work. And us doing the live read for either New Relic that I'll do in 10 minutes or previously for, or, you know, the MailChimp ones um, or, or the other ones for Snap Terms and other people, like that really works because you have this really tight, hardcore audience who will then amplify it. But in business to business, it works like with what Leo's doing and I'm doing. But for Adam Carolla, I think it's even it's a little bit more challenging because you have to hit really true scale to get Budweiser or, or Nike. So, anyway, listen, it's a it's an interesting discussion. I don't want to talk about myself too much on my own show because we're here to talk about the news. But for me, it's also 
you know, I've got to think about my career. I want to do bigger and better things. Like the launch conference is getting really big and scaling, and I'm giving away thousands of free tickets to developers and doing a hackathon. I want to focus on the things that are winning and that are easier to do. And I got the launch of Inside. I got Mahalo is really doing well now again with the video content. So, you know, you got you got to. There's only so much time you have in the day. You got to start cutting things, and that's what I'm doing. I'm paring down to focus on the winners. Let's go to the next story. All right, so the big story this week was about Instagram. It started off in the beginning of the week with Instagram saying, hey, we're going to change our tam- terms of service. Right. And everybody freaking out. Yep. And Instagram saying, okay, maybe we won't do that after all. Um, the language that really kind of freaked people out was to help us deliver interesting paid <coughs> or sponsored content or promotions. You agree that a business or other entity may pay us to display your username, likeness, photos, along with any associated metadata and or actions you take in connection with paid or sponsored content or promotions without any compensation to you. Kill yourself. Yeah, and so, you know, Instagram said this is, you know, to combat spam, protect users, nothing's <laughs> changing about photo ownership. Uh, even Mark Zuckerberg's wedding photographer uh, got involved and said that he didn't like the, the new terms of service. National Geographic said we're not going to post any new photos to Instagram. Um, of course, this forced Instagram to change direction. Kevin Systrom uh said, you know, we're going back to the original terms of service we've had since 2010. He said, we're going to take the time to complete our plans and then come back to our users and explain how we would like for our advertising business to work. So should Instagram have backtracked and is Kevin Systrom's plan going to work? Rafe, what do you think about this whole brouhaha? Well, it's fitting that Instagram is part of Facebook, isn't it? Because, you know, this is a company that is, Facebook traditionally has had a, um, I'm part of Evernote now, so I have to be judicious about this thing. But I think historically they've been a little bit tone deaf on uh, changes they make to privacy policies, uh, coming back to bite them, and then they end up doing them anyway, just in a different wording. Um, so it was a mistake. It wasn't a huge fundamental difference from their previous term of, terms of service, though, which is what's staggering me. It's like in the Instagram TOS always said, we can reuse your images in any way that we want, including for, to sell advertise on them, advertising right. on them. So this just brought it to the fore, and it, it tweaked it a little bit to make it appear to be much more horrible than it already was. But it was already pretty much, you put something on Instagram, you're putting something on Instagram. I mean, right. what do you expect? Yeah. Robert, what do you think about the whole brouhaha? I, it, is it, is I spent, it an indication of something larger? Facebook. I spent a day at Facebook on Tuesday, and... Um, uh, got to meet a lot of their executives and see what they're th- how they think. And they're heading into a war with Google over a contextual future. And what do I mean by that? Let's say I take a picture of you, um, like I'm looking at the Golden Gate Bridge, on the Golden Gate Bridge, and we're walking around. And it's going to know, based on our past behavior, when we have lunch, what we usually have for lunch, wh- you know, what's our next meeting. Google now is already doing this, right? And it can come back and say, hey, you know, right underneath the photo, hey, you, do you want to go to uh, lunch in Sausalito? And it'll give us three choices. That's a new kind of advertising, and they're going to play around with this kind of new kind of advertising that's laid on top or next to our photos, our, our content. And they were just signaling to the world that they're going to be playing around with new kinds of advertising. But what's funny is The Verge just nailed it. They, they said that the old terms of service was less restrictive on this kind of advertising than the new terms. The new terms were just clearer. And they said uh, the lesson for startup entrepreneurs is be less clear on your, on your terms of service so nobody can take you out in the public and trash you. Well, it sounds like they were becoming uh, more clear. That's a cynical way of putting it. Yeah, and they it's were be- cynical, but it's, it, it, it's out there on the verge, uh, you know. Yeah, and it there's another thing you can do, which is to build a business that isn't based on uh, turning other people's content into, you know, advertising material. I'm just saying. Okay, welcome to Smug Mug. Are you gonna? Everybody's gonna pay forty dollars a year for storing their photos. And yeah, I mean, it, it, with other is this indicative though of the fact Instagram was a loved company when it was independent? I mean, people loved this company in a way they love Evernote, and they go into Facebook, and now they are absolutely hated, and people mistrust them. And when they, even when the announcement that they were bought by Facebook, you had this sort of bubbling up of. You know, let's call it the avant-garde, the early adopters were, I'm turning off my Instagram, I'm turning off my Instagram. I stopped posting to Instagram photos, and now you have, you know, what feels like maybe a hundred times more noise about this. Do people just absolutely not trust Facebook, Rafe? Yeah, you, you know, I, when it's I, funny, it, it, the, thing Robert, compla- yeah. Yeah. The, the thing about people complaining about uh, Facebook's missteps or Instagram's is that... 
uh, a small number of people can make a lot of noise. When you have two million people complaining about something that Facebook does, you know, changing their TOS, and this kind of thing has happened before, and posting about it and complaining about it and saying they're going to leave, that's two million people. That is a lot of people, but it's also two tenths of a percent of the Facebook user base. Right. It's a tiny proportion of people who are saying that they're really annoyed, but really, I think most people. Right. So obviously, most people are not leaving the service, but it is significant. Robert, is this a growing trend? Yeah, uh, you know, Facebook is not a, a company that people use the word trust with. And there's a whole lot of reasons. Every year, they piss off their existing user base, all the way back to when they were in Harvard, right? Yep. The Harvard kids all hated that the Stanford <clears throat> kids got led on the service. And then the Stanford kids, all of them, got hated that the parents could join the service. And then they all, remember a million people protested the news feed when that turned on? And, and then, Beacon. Uh, Every year they do something to, that pisses off their ex existing user base, and um, that's part of their culture. I mean, I, walking around their their uh, headquarters is signs like every thirty feet that says, uh, "You're you, hack this." You know, go. It, it's your uh, it's your uh, you know. You should be a, a hacker culture. I have to, my. Oh God, I forget what this. <laughs> it is like I mean, a Jason, hacking culture, right? Yes. But Jason, going yeah. back to your 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 thesis from it's earlier this week about hack moderate. It's what does the sign say? It's your duty to hack this. Yeah, here's a picture of one of the signs. Yeah. It's your duty to hack, right? And and by they when they say hack though, it's a fine line between, you know, creating something novel, but actually thinking about the repercussions of it. They don't seem at that company Ooh. and it and you know companies take on the, the, the personalities of their leaders, they don't seem to care about the repercussions of their own actions, including with groups, they, people allowing other people to be assigned to groups, which led to dozens of gay people being outed to their families, Robert. They, they do deeply care about what you think, but they have a culture where they test things out and watch what are, we, how we behave in real time, and then they turn up the dial or down the dial. Even with this privacy thing, right? They they checked them in in New Zealand first, watched the results. Do people like it more or less? And they can tell based on your behavior on the service whether you like a change or not. It's mm. extraordinary the amount of instrumentation that Facebook has put in place so that their algorithms can adjust to our behavior and know in real time whether or not we like it or not or don't. Do you like trust it. them? Yes or no, Robert? I do. You they, do. They're Why? One of four companies that has my credit card. Interesting. Rafe, do yeah. you trust them? Trust Facebook? Yeah. With what? I mean, they do you, don't have on a personal card. basis, do you trust them? Are you, would you put no, in I private don't, information? I don't know. No, I, but so I put on Facebook what I'm comfortable being on Facebook, what I'm comfortable so that it might end up somewhere in some public site or in some government archives. I trust them to take to as much as I trust myself. But look, here's the thing about Facebook and them pushing the envelope. Would, you, would Facebook be successful as successful as they are right now, as successful at all if they didn't push the boundaries. I mean, when you're in technology, you've got to push it. You've got to take risks. The only difference with Facebook is that they're taking risks with people. But yeah. they have to. I'm not, I'm not apologizing for Facebook. I'm saying their mm. business model is to push the boundaries of acceptability and uh, what we consider socially okay. And as Robert says, then dial it back if they find that they go too far. go too far. But they have to push it or they cannot move forward. Okay, yeah, when we get back true. from the commercial, uh, Apple uh, killed a Kickstarter project, essentially, path ended search. Uh, looks like uh, Facebook ripped off um, Snapchat and created a competitor. 84% of Kickstarter projects ship late. Uh, Facebook put the ads on its network, blah, 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 blah. Lots of interesting stuff coming up in just a minute. But let me take a pause right now for the cause and tell you about New Relic, New Relic. This is what I'd use internally to do all our server monitoring. And uh, real user experiences, code level app performance, server resources. You can see it all here on my screen. If you've got uh, web servers and you've got apps running, you want to know, you know, how much of your speed is, or or delays or efficiency is being caused by page rendering or your network or the web application or the servers. And I get all this beautiful email every day telling me how we're doing with uptime, downtime, etc. And New Relic provides that same service, not just to me, but to Skullcandy, Spotify, Nike, Zillow, Vonage, a huge swath of you know the top, top names in the industry. A lot of the fans of the show are using the product. And if you go to newrelic.com slash thisweekend, you can get the exclusive Twist Samurai t-shirt for free. 
by signing up. It's fast, it's easy. There's no credit card. If you want X-ray vision into your web app, sign up today and get a free This Week in Startups t-shirt. That's right. NewRelic.com slash This Week in. And if you want to just take a moment to thank them on your Twitter account, just say thank you at New Relic for supporting This Week in Startups and that you really appreciate it. They love that kind of stuff. Kieran, next story. Well, I, I actually find this very interesting. Twitter is finally going to let you access your full archive of tweets. Right? Yeah. This was something that Dick Costolo had promised would happen by the end of the year. <laughs> I think the engineers were a little worried when he yeah. said that. Um, so now you can, if you actually are one of the people who's got access to your uh, archive already, you can view tweets by month. You can search certain words, yep. phrases, hashtags, usernames. Hmm. Um, you can... Long overdue. Right, right. You're gonna, you're gonna Facebook would have to... had this feature like in month five. Right, you're gonna you're gonna have finally what I think you should have had since the beginning. Right. That's just my what do you opinion. think, Rafe? It took Facebook years before they could, they offered a download everything feature. Did they? Uh, it yeah, and they do now. But and, and then it's in a. Why is it such a big deal for people to have this feature? Is this the, it's the last thing you get to on the roadmap? I guess so. It's not something that most people use every day. I think it's a great thing. I I, I you know I consider all my tweets precious, right? And I want to keep them. Yeah. So. Robert I, is the, finally is what I say. Robert is the I reason got 60, that they've made of them. <laughs> yeah. Robert is the reason they've made this inaccessible so that people cannot create a competitor and that's export them it. and auto import them into Path. That's I, part of it. Oh, that on. that's certainly part of it. It's part of it's uh, like you said, a startup has to prioritize what it does, and you know, uh, look at their uh, at their uh, uh, dealing with lists. You know, I need lists. I'm a heavy user. I need lists. They say nobody uses lists. They are looking at the user who just joined to watch the Pope right now. Right. And and there's a lot more of those users out there than are going to listen to anything you and I or Ray say. God, the list service so, sucks. Like, it's still like it, I, I, I'm, I, you're capped at 500 people it, per list. You can't edit your well, list easily. On, on Facebook, I have a list of 2,100 startups. I love that. And one. I'm only a couple of weeks, months into this uh, project of mine to find every startup and put it on a Facebook list. Uh, Twitter limits you to 500. So I can't even do that list on Twitter, hmm. even though I wish I could, because Twitter actually has uh, a lot more startups and a lot more flow. I mean, yeah. I, you know, let me just show you my Twitter, what it looks like. It, you know, all day long, it, it looks yeah. like this. It just keeps moving. Yeah. You know? Hey, I'd Rafe, love to watch every twi every startup like that, but I can't. Yeah, Rafe, you you, you sort of uh, snickered and laughed when I said, like, are they not providing the full archive because somebody could use it as an export to a Twitter competitor like App.net or Path? Why is it laughable? Well, because these services, <clears throat> Path, uh, Twitter, App.net, they're all about the present. I mean, the, the ability to archive is is a feature for geeks and and writers who. Uh, so I, I don't think it's a competitive thing. I don't think that uh, anybody's going to leave Twitter for a competing service over the archive feature. I think it's to keep the geeks happy. I don't, I don't think no, it's that big a deal. But the, but, but the fear, Ray, uh, Rafe, is that if you imported, let's say, my 60,000 tweets, I've literally touched or retweeted or shared um, almost everybody in the tech industry. You could get a really good social graph off of that. And ah. now you can import that and build a new kind of service that would be even better than Twitter and offer more utility. And then all of a sudden the geeks would start going over it. And that, once the geeks do, that brings everybody so else in. Re in a way, you know? Robert, what you're saying is the super routers like yourself and, and myself to a lesser extent, people who have 100,000 followers or more, they become like this incredible archaeological discovery for the new services. Yeah, and if we can convince the, the geeks in the world to move, that mm. causes everybody else to move. Interesting. You know, Twitter, I, you know this is a I very interesting Twitter. discussion that's never actually taken place. It's a very I, interesting discussion. I joined when Twitter had 13,000 people, and I was 13,560 yeah. first person on Twitter, you know? And now there's 200 million people on the service in, since, what, 2006. So I've seen this over and over again. I remember being early on ICQ, you know, and I watched how that spread from the geek community into late, middle adopter to late adopter. Um, you know, people assume that these things just happen. They don't just happen. Somebody starts talking about Robert. Ten years from now, friends on it. Ten years from now, what are the chances, percentage basis, please? And then, Ray, if you go next, um, that the leading social network, in terms of you know unique users per month, monthly active users, ten years from this date, percentage chance it's Twitter, percentage tw chance it's Facebook, percentage chance it's some other one. Robert? Some other one, 
89% some other one, and the, and the 11% break the 11% down by Twitter and Facebook. Twitter is yeah, what? Look, look at Instagram. Instagram is only, what, two years old, and it has 130 million users on it. And I, I've sat next to people who say, I use Instagram more than I use Facebook. Yeah. Well, now they're using Facebook. Rafe, what do you think Facebook. on a percentage basis, if you, had to, if you had to guess, 10 years from today? 10 years today, uh, I'd say 95% Facebook is not the number one social network. Wow. 10 years, I mean, come on, anything can happen. Right. See, that is a, it's very that, interesting. When you ask smart people if they think, and this, and this is an indication not clearly of the Facebook mind, executive team or management team, because they're amazing, not an indication of the money they have in the bank or yeah. the scale of their network. It's an indication of how fickle the audience is. Is it not, Robert? Yeah, I, you know, I, I've been on the online community since 85. I, I used to be on Prodigy. Then we moved to AOL. Then we moved from AOL to CompuServe. Then we moved from CompuServe to Usenet. Then we moved from Usenet to uh, <coughs> the web. And then, then we moved from the web to all these new things, blogs and, and Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and Instagram. And, you know, and we move around a lot because our devices change. I mean, hell, five years ago, we didn't have these things in our, in our hands or, or these things, you know? Yeah. Yeah, not yeah, only so do we move around, changes. but there's the the audience continues to renew itself. I mean, the the yeah. bark keeps coming up from fresh. It's young people, and we get bored. kids. The new generation comes online, and they don't want to use the same thing that everybody else is using. It's a natural yeah. progression to push away from the existing established networks into new networks. That's the way people, the way human society grows up. Which is the same Look as music, right? Like, that. I'm not going to listen to rock and roll. I'm going to listen to punk. I'm not going to listen to punk. I'm going to listen to new wave. I'm not going to listen to new wave. I'm going to listen to garbage Britney Spears. Well, look at how fast Snapchat grew, right? Yeah. The next one that happens will grow extraordinarily fast because we're all connected to each other. Yeah. And we have the ability to say, hey, check out this new thing. Let's yeah. segue into Snapchat's uh, latest competitor, Karen. Um, yeah, that was uh, Facebook. Poke. Right? Facebook took their feature Poke and made their own uh, social network today. Okay. Robert, is this a pathetic, uh, desperate uh, act on Zuckerberg's part, or is it part of a negotiating tactic to buy Poke, to buy Snapchat? Uh, I think it's a smart business to be a fast follower. I, I watched Microsoft put uh, fast following in, in play in the 90s, and they just wiped the table by being a fast follower. You don't need to be first, because the first guy has to spend a lot of time innovating and, and figuring out a, a new usage model. As long as you're there within a few months of something happening, you can, uh, one, keep that, from, that other thing from happening in a big way, and two, you can keep your service relevant, and three, you buy the ones that you can't, like it, Facebook bought Instagram, right? Right. If, they, if Zuckerberg keeps doing that, he stays on top. It's going to be when he has to take his eye off the ball, either he gets old and, and really rich and he wants to go and just enjoy life and not... I, I saw this happen with uh, Bill Gates, right? I, you know, I kept bringing stuff to Bill Gates and saying, hey, there's something happening with this blog world, with Skype, with, it, with uh, uh, wikis, with, and, and Bill and the executive team was like, go away. We're running a $4 billion a year business. And, and later I learned Bill didn't even want to run the company. He wanted to go into his foundation. He took his eye off the ball, and that's why Microsoft is very, very profitable, but it's not interesting anymore. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, with the exception of, I guess, the Xbox, which has been a phenomenally, with Connect, an exceptional product. And what do you think of the new Surface and the new sort of Windows 8 and the, and the tile interface? I think it's beautiful. It's beautiful, but it has no apps. And, it, it, you know, I look around the plane, I don't see one. I, I look around, I go to startups, and they're <clears> like, eh. Interesting. Rafe, what are your yeah. thoughts I mean, on? Do you know you know a lot of developers in LA? Yeah. Or is anybody going? Oh my God, I'm billing for this. I'm just, I, I'm stopping all iOS development. I'm stopping all Android development. And I'm just going to pour my entire life into this thing. Not yet, but what I do yeah. see is I do see people putting in orders for surfaces and saying how much, or how much potential they see in it, and how they really like the interface. And if they get to scale, they're going to try something. So it's it's sort of like. It, it reminds me of the early days of Android where people were like, I'm monitoring it. So I think we're in the monitoring phase, looking for a pulse. I think they're nuts. The minute these Google glasses ship, Google sold 2,000 in one day at $1,500 a pop to 7,000 developers. 
that tells me there's heat, there's motion, emotion, there's, uh, I want to build for this thing. I'm going to, and when they get those, you know, whether it be March, April, May, June, they're going to spend every minute of every day thinking of new apps to put on those things and play around. And that's where their I, there attention is, is going to be. There it's not going to be going to build a Surface app. Go ahead, Riff. What do you think? There's a, we're, I think we're locked in the bubble. I think we've got to get out of Silicon Valley to understand what's really happening here. And, you know, you walk around anywhere in Silicon Valley and everybody's got their Macs and all the developers are excited about the Google Glasses. And we are, too. I mean, come on. That's unbelievably awesome. Okay, uh, so is Evernote developing for the Glasses? I don't know. I, honestly, I don't know. I, I know I that the engineers can't wait to get them. Okay, so you're obviously about. going to be part of the prototype. What, what do you think, you Evernote? Know, what would Evernote do with those glasses? Am I going to be uh, taking screenshots? Oh, so, and, oh it, it is so easy to figure out ways to integrate the Evernote. What is the number one on your list? What's the number one on Rafe's list for your personal usage of Evernote? Uh, I'd like to uh, get all the notes on somebody I'm meeting with uh, displayed in front of me so I can say, oh, you met last night with Jason six months ago. This is what you talked about while I'm talking to you. That's yeah, see, I would like to record what I'm doing into Evernote. That too. Yeah. Like, you know, like I'm talking to you and it's yeah. transcribing the conversation in real time and then I have a full text search. So then when I meet you the next time and I can just say as I'm like walking up to you, um, what's his kid's name? What's his son's name? I forgot. Boom. And it just right. queries back exactly. and it finds his son's I, name and what grade I think is that's, I think that stuff is a little bit of the rocket science stuff. I just, my son's in school right now. You know, he's using Evernote to capture whiteboards and stuff like that and, and keep notes. When you're wearing glasses, you can just scrub through the 4,000 images your, your glasses automatically shot today. Grab the four that have your notes from the board and put them in Evernote. This is going to be you know, crazy. Are they going to ban these in school, you think? Uh, yes. Well, they banned calculators until they allowed them. You know, and they, uh, my, they, my then they changed education to focus on something else. My so, chemistry teacher, uh, by the way, was a renegade. She said, you're allowed to bring any modern device in the, into your test and use it, use it all you want. But she timed, time tested, and she made it so hard that if you spent one minute looking up a formula because you forgot the formula, that you would, you would not pass the test. You had to memorize uh, the formulas, and, what, and you had to know the principles to pass her tests. And that made it extraordinarily hard to use technology. You well, know like, it anyways. Yeah, I mean, she, you, she you made, want to go into a mixed you... martial arts fight with a book on martial arts? I mean, come on. No. Exactly. She like, I'm in the ring. She to into a better computer than a computer was. That's hilarious. Yeah. So what do you, what do you think? I mean, Rafe, if you, if, yeah. do you think about that... About Windows 8? No. Uh, let's talk about the glasses and education and the world, mm -hmm. because we, we sort of spun in, and sometimes the most interesting topics on the show are the ones that we stumble upon. What impact are these things going to start getting banned? We saw the guy who had built his own version in McDonald's. The French basically beat him up. I don't know. I mean, the French are so serious. You talk about privacy, like the, these French guys in a McDonald's beat up a guy who's half blind for coming in with a camera recording them. They oh, I nearly got kicked. I nearly got kicked out of the Pompidou Center uh, when I was at Loeb a week or two ago because I was taking a picture of myself in front of something, which you're allowed to do, and I right. had a camera like that with the front camera, and <sighs> it just happened to be pointing at a uh, docent or something. Yeah. And he was, he was like, you it, in French, and it is not, inter, not allowed to take pictures of the staff. I was like, but, 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 and he was like. Yeah, exactly. Sure. And they basically beat yeah. this guy up and took his glasses from him, and the guy's half blind. What, what impact is going to have on society? Are they going to have, like, signs at bars and restaurants or gyms? Gym lockers, like I mean, I remember in New York, we had they had to put signs in gym lockers. You weren't well, allowed to take your, look, your phone out in the locker room because people were taking pictures of other guys' dongs. Eventually, look, the glasses. I don't know what the heck's going to happen with glasses. Uh, the the first version where there's like obvious. I mean, I saw somebody walking down the street the other day in Noe Valley, where every other person is a Google employee wearing the Google glasses. I was like, well, he sticks out. But you know, look, three or five years out from that, and they're going to be invisible. Yeah. I mean, you. Might, they're totally invisible. Maybe you'll need a <clears throat> button on your shirt or something in regular glasses like these or, you know, a contact Ugh. lens or something. Wow. So you won't be able to tell. So the idea of, being, of, having, uh, of having a no glasses zone and no recording zone is just going to be honor system. It's going to change the way society works if it comes to that. So assume everything's being recorded at all times. Yeah. Robert, right. what do you think? Well, I, I'm showing you this app called Light, which I use. I, here's the Qualcomm Museum I, I visited. And I just shot a bunch of frames, and now I can scrub through days of my life really, really quickly. Here's, is that the one you I'm put in the pouch on your chest? 
Uh, is that when you no, put your... No, no, no. I just cut, shot these with my iPhone. But imagine I'm walking around the, the world wearing a Google Glass, and I can just scrub through thousands of frames like this. Wait, wait. But you uh, did that by how? You were just holding your phone? Or I'm, using, you... I'm using this app called Light, L-I-G-H-T-T. -T. Uh -huh. And when you take one picture, it takes actually 10 pictures over two seconds. And it makes like a little, almost like a video, but it's not a video. It's, it's discrete frames. So this life casting is, 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 is starting to hit. You, and, and you guys got to check out this thing called Mimoto, M-E-M-O-T-O. -O. It's a little camera you wear on your shirt, and it takes a picture every 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah so that's Google what Glass are going to do that. GoPro is, is doing that. I, I know people who wear a little GoPro. Wow, look at like this that. Mimoto. You know, you, you knew these were coming, but mm -hmm. wow, that's incredible. Yeah. Isn't it? That's nuts. And so it just takes a picture every X number of seconds. And now By you're way, live casting. Buy Seagate, because those things generate like a terabyte a day of data. Wow. Look at I'm going to play it. Pull up my computer, guys. Seagate was here this morning, by the way. <laughs> hey, guys, pull up my computer in the control room. Oh, it's not working? Okay. Uh, we can't. Let me plug it in again. That's a pretty amazing demo. Yeah. Uh, there was somebody who was making a really cool product, which was a pouch that you wore on your chest, and you put your iPhone into the pouch, and you flip it, yep. and then, um, oh, you got my computer? Here it is. So this is the uh, video, but it, you would flip that pouch around and it would just take, the, the app would take a picture every second. And then you would stitch it together. It was really interesting. So let's see here. But you guys aren't getting my audio or are you getting my audio? There we go. Oh, see they're, yeah, they're going after your... Aw. So remembering first kisses. All right, whatever. Enough of that. Um, all right, let's do the next story. Well, since you're talking about remembering things, I think path adding <laughs> search seems like a good story to go to. Yeah, so path. We know you're a big fan of path. So Love just, path. Dave Moore, great entrepreneur. So just yesterday this came out. Now you'll have the ability to search your moments, and you can use all kinds of terms like, you know, watching a baseball game and things like that. So yep. things that aren't necessarily search terms. You can yep. also import things from Facebook, Instagram, and Foursquare. Mm. Uh, it's going to be um, also having this nearby uh, feature where you can ne get nearby moments. Ah, so neat. let's say you're at this bar and you yeah. can see what else has happened around there. In um, your life. In your, in your life. Yeah. In your life. Exactly. So um, Why didn't is, Facebook come up with this? Oh, yeah, they're going to copy it in 30 days. Keep going. So uh, actually, Sarah Lacey had an interesting piece yesterday saying she thinks this gets around the problem of your close friends and family not adapting path. Like, you know, I have friends and family who won't get on path. Right. They, they're on Facebook. For whatever reason, they're wait, not moving wait, what anytime is her, soon. What is Sarah's point? So part of the problem with path is that there are lots of folks who can be on it themselves, but they're not getting their, that, those important 10, 15, 20 people in their lives. I've been trying to, to do it. this. I got my brother Josh on. I don't have my mom on you. I can't get my mom, my mm -hmm. father, my right. brother. And this helps not it how? On. This helps because now it becomes part of your journaling, right? Uh, so I can go back and use this as my own life sort of place to capture oh, memory. It incentivizes. It, it reminds people that... You're missing mom in your life's tree. Yeah. What do you think of the new search features, Robert? You're a big... I, I like them. I, I think this is yet, yet another trend that we're seeing of big data uh, used to bring us value out of our lives. And it, Path won't be the only one. That Facebook has a few things up its sleeve. Tw uh, Google Plus, I was talking to Vic this morning. He has a few things coming to show you your life back. Um, and it's going to be a big trend. And... and yeah. I, is I like Facebook it. going to launch a YouTube competitor, Robert? I've been hearing this buzz a little bit now. The chatter is getting louder. What do you think? What are you hearing? I, I assume they will because the, they don't want Google to take over any part of the world. They, they need to compete with Google on all fronts. Uh, capture our emotional behaviors around people, places, and things. And, and so video is video. a key component. Absolutely. I, you know, we're recording video all the time in our lives. I mean, this is professional video, but I pull out the camera and shoot my <clears> kid. That's an emotional thing. I'm, and that's what Google client. Hangouts is about, correct? Uh, well, Google Hangouts is about collaboration. Um, but then saving and, to video for recording for posterity, it seems like. Yes. Yep. There's a lot there. Uh, Google, is, Google and Facebook and, to a lesser extent, Apple and Amazon are going to study uh, us and try to get uh, new insights about our behaviors to build new product in the future. Right. Rafe, what do you think? Google, Google Now is a great example of that. 
Yeah. Rafe, what do you think about the new path? Well, I was just pathing right now. I, yeah. I love path. I think it's beautiful. But until they launched this search feature and I saw it bubble up in the news, I hadn't been on it in a long time ah. because, you know, the standard argument that I made two years ago between uh, Twitter and Google Plus and Facebook, which are my main social avenues, um, I have not been able to fit path in. And the new feature I think is beautiful. I, path has an unbelievably gorgeous experience. I mean, we all know that, right? But yeah. is it enough to pull me away and pull my friends away from these other services? I mean, I'm trying to get into app.net, but it's like, uh, I want to, but come on. Yeah, committed. I've been using, I've been like syndicating to app.net and I, and I really mm -hmm. want to see them succeed, but I haven't moved over there yet. But I mean, like in terms of pictures of your kids, do you share pictures mm -hmm. of your kid? You have one kid, right? So yeah, in terms um, of kids and children, you wouldn't share it on Twitter or Facebook, would you, or do you? I would share it on Facebook on, to a limited circle, which is a pain in the neck, but you can do it. Right. I don't share things uh, like that on Twitter anymore. Right. Uh, I would do it on Path if ever if my family was on Path. Yeah. Um, we'll get, when we talk about YouTube a little bit later, we'll talk about video sharing where things get really interesting and it's a, there's a real opportunity there because it is so freaking hard right now to share videos. And yeah, what is the opportunity there? Tell us, Riff. Well, if you want to share a video right now, uh, it's a pain in the neck to upload and the easiest thing to do is put it up on YouTube, but then you get this private <laughs> URL which is which is obfuscated but not really secure. Right. And there are other other companies like um, uh, Boxy is doing with Cloudy and mm -hmm. another one that I saw whose name will come back to me. Right. That makes sharing videos easier, which is really right. important. Yeah, I agree. Right. Did you get? Did you see the new uh, YouTube uh, capture app that was? Yeah, released? hey, Kieran. Yeah. Read, that's, 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 that. that's exactly what I'm talking about. All right, let's right. let that Kieran yeah. read. Let, let's let right. Kieran read the news. Go ahead, Kieran. So uh, uh, the cap Kieran's going to read the news. The capture app that came out this week. It's ready to record as soon as you open it. Yeah. You write a caption. You select where to share it to. The video keeps uploading in the background, and it allows you to do color correction, stabilization. You can trim length, add background music. Hmm. Records horizontally, hmm. even if you're shooting vertically, which oh, wow. uh, Liz Gaines of all things do seem to like a lot. And and right now it's iOS only, Android in the future. So I'm kind of wondering if this is actually better than the native camera app on your, in your oh, iPhone. Oh, it's definitely, definitely. And the who, way you described it, it's much better. Yeah. And who do you think is going to be the most passionate no, wait, user? Is this to send stuff privately, though, to your like Google yes. Plus circle? Yeah. Yes. Wow. So that's a killer feature. And I think it's the one Rafe just described, which I was like using Vimeo for this a little bit and putting passwords on London's videos and then sending it to my mom. But I was hoping that the new iOS... What do they call the streams on iOS of photos, like photo streams or something? The, the photo stream. Yeah, photo stream. Yeah, like I got the photo yeah, we stream. Were all, sharing. We were all expecting that they would make photos, they make sharing videos from photo stream as easy as it makes photos, but for some reason, Apple has decided not to enable that feature. Oh. Obviously, it's expensive in terms of bandwidth and storage, but that would be, that's an Did opportunity. Apple, I don't know why they're not doing it. I don't understand Apple with the software. I mean, how could they suck so bad at software? And then they fired the guy, Forstall, who I, I guess got the. Um, Apple Maps going, I felt like at least they got a product out into market. I feel like they're so, such perfectionists that they will just not release product. The goddamn stock ticker on the Apple, the stock app on Apple has not changed in five years. Why is Apple suck so much, Robert? I, I think it's a unwillingness to compete with its own developer community. The, the real thing that keeps me on Apple right now is the apps. Uh, they're, like you said, uh, Windows 8 or Windows Phone has a better user interface and you could argue even has better hardware thanks to Nokia. Um, although I'd, I'd make that argument on the iOS side, but they, you know, they, they're coming up with some good ideas, certainly better cameras. Yeah. Um, but the thing that keeps me on Apple is the apps. Right. It's Evernote. And the, until I hear developers at Evernote or Facebook or Twitter or, or any X number little startup, get excited about some other platform and start building for that on nights and weekends, which is where the love happens, I'm not going to switch. Hmm. Nights and love, the, the, the nights and weekends, uh, Scoble law. If, if, it's a Scoble law. If developers are making stuff on from. nights and weekends, that means your platform is going to be successful. Rafe, what do you think? <laughs> Go ahead, Rafe. <laughs> well, yeah, I, that means if the developers can develop the platform, but then you have to sell the thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, the real world out there, even if developers aren't excited about things like Windows, Windows 8, that's the market. And that's what that's $600 PCs. That's a big market that will, right, will right. remain but a market that, for a while. That, that just means you get me too -ism. That means you port your Evernote app to that platform. And that's great. You're going to make a load of money doing that. Right? Ding, ding, ding. But, that, but that's not your love. That's not love. That. What I'm watching now is sit down with the engineering team at Facebook and ask them, what's going on at night? 
what what are you guys building here mm -hmm. at night? You know, and um, I haven't seen a mass move. Why well, haven't they done have something said, innovative that's... though? Like, where's the where's the what's the most innovative thing you've seen out of Facebook in the last year, Robert? Uh, <clears throat> lists. Lists. That's the most innovative thing. Wow. Yeah. Has anybody else done them? Google Plus spent a billion dollars building a social network. It hasn't built them. I can't share a list of more. I than do like the community feature of Google Plus. You have to admit that's pretty Twi slick. Twitter has no it has lists that I can't put more than five hundred things on. I have a startup list with twenty two hundred startups on it. So okay, so I that's that's the state that of innovation you. today. Facebook's biggest innovation is they created a list that will go it, over five hundred. You know, Facebook's innovation, and really a... innovation, and Google Plus's innovation is innovation at scale. They have a billion people, and when they do it, everybody yeah, gets their, it. Yeah, their innovation I, I is to get at... the 19th most popular no, Android phone me, to though. work better. You're mishearing me. I'm not asking what they did for Facebook at nights and weekends. <clears throat> I'm asking what are the engineering, if you get the engineers What are they screwing drunk, with? Yeah. What are they screwing with? What do they care what about? Startup what startup are, are they, they conceiving? For? Right. Exactly, because startups happen a lot of times in the bowels of a big company. Remember how Apple happened? It was Steve Wozniak uh, working at HP. Steve wanted to work at HP and keep working there. Yep. And his boss said, I will never sell your personal computer. Go build a company about that if you care so much about it. He, he asked him twice to do that. Yeah. That's how companies happen. Hey, does, anybody have the, does anybody have the remote control, universal remote that Woz made? Did he ever get that done? Remember the universal yeah. remote? It didn't. It didn't take off because. <sighs> Who's it, got the prototype? Who's got one of those? What was it called? Uh, they, they sold them. You could have bought one at Fry's. Oh God, I want to get one of those and it, put it like in a glass box. Next story, Karen. All right, so I think we've got to talk about Kickstarter. Kickstarter is in the news big time. Yes, so 84% of the top 50, and that's just, you know, of those that, that uh, CNN Money examined. Yep. Those are uh, all with ship dates of November 2012 or earlier. Of that top 50, 84% shipped late. The this is why everybody's in a panic right now. Median delay was yeah. two months. Um, the caveat, of course, is that a lot of those top projects were tech design video games. They think sure. that other categories might not have the same issues. But Yeah, the, like most independent films get done on time. <laughs> Keep going. Well, so a common problem, you know, from, from talking to these companies is that when they get really, really popular, suddenly they're overwhelmed and that totally blows their timelines for shipping products that they were, maybe they thought Why? we could make Why? a couple hundred if you that have to make, make a couple thousand. If you, if you have to make if a you're thousand them by or ten hand. thousand. It, oh, if you make it by hand, of course. But if you're making a <laughs> thousand or ten thousand, it shouldn't be a problem, right, Robert? Or right, or right. Well, and the other no, part these of things are still in development. I mean, Kickstarter projects, this to me is what do you expect from a bunch of engineers trying to estimate how long it's going to take them to figure out, to, to design and then build something? Yeah, I mean, the expectation I mean, two should months, be it's a late. Two yeah. months, a two month delay on a brand new piece of hardware or yeah. software or game or a film or even an album, that is nothing. Yeah, Why I mean, are people yeah. getting upset about this? It's, if, you're, if you're buying something on Kickstarter, buying, right? Because you're yeah. not supposed to do that. But if you're funding something on Kickstarter, in September, and you think you're going to get it in time to give it as a present in December, you're an idiot. You're at the wrong place. Yeah, exactly. Also, you should accept when you're investing, uh, whether it be $100 on a Kickstarter team or $100,000 on an angel startup, you are taking an extraordinary amount of risk. Yes. You accept know, Jason. It. Accept it's it. It's accepted, right? Yeah. So you have to. This is the press. This is, the, I'll tell you what this is. Bucks. This is the press causing trouble. Yeah. It's like the Series A crunch. Like the press, a lot of the members of the press have no idea what they're talking about, right? They're writing posts that Google That's bought true. a company for $400 million based on a press release and never calling anybody at Google, right? I'll leave the blog nameless. Well, CNN Money... Or they're blogging drunk. Actually you went and, and did the research, right? This right. isn't just something that they pull out of their butts. No, no, I know that. But I, what, I, what I will say is the, the press is in such a dogfight for attention right now and yeah. for survival... And I think Rafe got off of the, the, bu the bus at the right time, uh, right before it went off the cliff, is that <clears throat> they have to cause trouble. They have to try to come up with a controversy to try to get some of the, the attention back from all the other stuff that's going on in the world. And, yeah. and this, is, this like constant fascination with products being delayed or being canceled on Kickstarter, I'm surprised that any of those Kickstarter projects may get to fruition. If one out of exactly. five did, you should be happy, right, Rafe? Oh, totally. But you know what? I think this is interesting. If this is actually a deal with consumers, which I'm not sure it is, but if it is, and I think crowdfunding is going to be in trouble <laughs> because people in, I mean, Kickstarter is not an investment and it's not a purchase. It is funding something because you think it's going to be cool and maybe it's you a get gift. a little bit back. It's a donation. Sort, yeah. Yeah. And 
they give you the product to encourage the donation. I mean, it's a weird transaction. Yeah, and crowdfunding, I don't know if consumers are going to get it because Kickstarter is kind of halfway there. Yeah. And when people put, you know, $1,000 into some cool startup and then it goes belly up, oh, man. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to be a disaster. I mean, yeah, so, so Yancey Strickler did say that, you know, of course, we're not a store. It's about the journey, those kind of things that he said in the past. But he also right. said it's worth having a conversation about promise versus delivery. So what do you think Kickstarter should actually do in the coming year? I, I think Kickstarter needs to be very explicit in telling people that, you know, you're trying, you're taking a huge risk. There's no way, there, there's no chance, like, um, th there's no guarantees. And they may have to just say, like, timelines will move, you know? Like, this idea of an expected delivery date, maybe they should just take that off there and be like, we predict this project will take six to 12 months to complete. And put a range in there, which means you could get the product in the third or fourth quarter, you know? Just very open up the range of when things are going to be delivered, as opposed to now where they're forcing people to make definitive timelines and dates. Just make it a range. We think it's going to take six months. We think it's going to take 12 months. I mean, look at Space Monkey from last year, yep. which I'm an investor in. Like, they're, uh, without inside information, they're not launched yet, so they're going to launch soon. But these projects. Where the hell are they? That's time. one of the most awesome things I've ever seen. What's that? Space, Space Monkey. Space Monkey. You're, oh. Yeah, I'm an investor awesome. in it, and it, listen, there'll, there'll be some news very shortly, but, uh, right, you know, I'm they're waiting. getting very close, so. But it does take a long time when you've got like a prototype, because that was like a very prototypey type thing we exactly. led into a launch conference, yeah. you know, to make it a reality. Things take a year sometimes. That's it. What do you think they should do, Robert? Any ideas? Uh, try to be transparent about what the, the risks are and where, you know, I'm just thinking back. I've been to China. I'm one of the few journalists, by the way, who's been to PCH. Liam, uh, who owns <coughs> PCH, says it's shocking to him how few journalists actually PCH is? China. PCH uh, is a huge supply chain in Shenzhen that makes a lot of uh, the things we own. Uh, yeah. I've been to they, Shenzhen. You know, Just made, for the record. You've I've, been to Shenzhen? I've been to Shenzhen. Yeah. But m most journalists don't, don't go and don't visit and go, don't see inside the machinery why it's so difficult to build a product and why it's so difficult to get it to market. Um, you know, it, uh, here's, a, here's an example. You, it, it, GoPro, for instance. GoPro was designed 200 yards from my house. So I, I spent some time with Nick talking about GoPro. They just got $200 million investment from um, uh, the other guys in China. Uh, Foxconn. Who makes that? Foxconn, yes. And, uh, but th that did, it didn't start that way. It started with less than $10,000 in in with his mom's sewing machine. He made a prototype of an idea. He found a partner in China who, who uh, made, a, made the first product. It didn't quite work right. And you have this iteration loop that's very, very long. And if you don't uh, understand that, you're going to be really in, in trouble when you try to promise something because it takes time for a, a, a design what is to this, come um, back. What is this one that Apple essentially killed the Kickstarter project? Explain that, Karen. Right. This Explain is, that. This is a little bit different than the typical Kickstarter project. Yeah. So uh, they were funded $139,000. The um, name of the project is? It's POP. It's a portable power station. So I paid for this. Yeah, so the idea being that you could plug in and charge any kind of small device, not right. just an iPhone or an iPad. It was but a also... multi-device charging battery station. Exactly. And the problem was that Apple refused to license the lightning connector to them. Right. And the reason, but the reason was, yeah, because they were going to be able to charge things other than Apple products. Ugh. That's that's what seems to be the issue. Yeah. And um, the CEO Jamie Siminoff has said, he's you know, been on the program. He said we're pissed. I think they're being a bunch of assholes. I think they're hurting their customers. In his letter to backers, he said we don't believe in selling a substandard, com compromised product that only satisfies the needs of a few right. backers. So he's actually refunding all their money. I mean. Everything, including the five percent fee. He's taking the hit from the Kickstarter so he's fees, a, he's credit card a five, fees. He's taking a ten thousand dollar hit, probably five percent. He, he's of just said we're, no, we're just not going to do this. Now here's the thing, I'll tell you why this is a PR marketing stunt. I'm friends with James, obviously, but um, he's been on the program. This is a PR marketing stunt because there's such an obvious solution here, which is they should just let you plug any cable into the pop. That's a USB cable. You plug the USB cable. What's on the other end? Apple can't control that. You could buy a USB to Lightning, USB to 30 pin USB to micro, USB to macro, whatever. You can be USB to anything. Mm -hmm. So they could have solved this problem. But I'll tell you what's going on here. He has his own platform now, right? He's got a company called Edison Jr. Right. But doesn't he also have his own platform for doing like sort of Kickstarter-y things? 
I didn't look into that. Yeah, see, I think he's yeah. he's sort of making noise because he wants to get more people onto his platform and stuff like that and create more attention around what he's doing. So this, to me, reeks of a PR stunt. So yeah. do you think he has a legitimate beef with I, Apple? What do you think about the beef with Apple? I, Apple yeah. being controlling and, and yeah. wanting to uh, keep its destiny intact? <laughs> yeah, of course. Look, and now what, I, look I... I, I'm inside. I'm inside a software company right now. Apple's one of our biggest platforms. Let me tell you something. You do not go calling Apple names like that. Not if you want a future with Apple. That's a very interesting, and it's got to be. I hope. I really hope it's a calculated PR move because otherwise, it is really dumb. Well, yeah. yeah. Tell, telling them that they're being a bunch of a holes. He, any company. You're, you're, put this way, he's not well, getting Apple a free lunch. Jason, Jason, let me you tell you, you the economic that. power that Apple <clears> has. In June of last year, an Apple team went to Oakley and says, we have a partner, we have shelf space. And guess what? By November, their product was on the shelf. It's called Airwave. It has a heads-up display and ski goggles, and they are sold out. Apple has the ability to change companies' balance sheets forever. If because of the stores. Coffee. Because of the stores. Because of their stores and their economic power and their brand love around the world. I mean, I, you know, I look, I'm talking to an Apple, the computer. I have two Apple computers here. The economic power of this company is extraordinary. So do you think the stock is going to get cut in half like somebody else said? I know you're not a stock picker, I, but. No, I think there's a good risk of that because of other market forces. I, you know, I, Google is in a much better position for this contextual age. Right. And I've been saying How it important is it for Apple to get a handle on advertising? Or can they just live it's in this? It's not advertising. It's a handle on everything. I know, it's but not, they have no advertising at, ability, oh, and the world wants free product. They have a no everything ability. They, Facebook and Google Plus and Twitter know a lot about me. And Apple know, knows what? The, the credit card number? Know? That's a good question. They know my credit card number. They do know they your credit card number. They know what apps you use. Yeah. Yes. They know what maybe what apps Apple's, I use. Look, Apple's a hardware business. They make nice margins on their hardware as long as they, the, the software is good enough. Yeah. Uh, as long as the apps keep coming in, as long as people like Robert and me keep uh, you know, changing out their old machines for new Apple machines, that's what makes, that, makes Apple work. Their hardware is still second to none. And do they need to have an advertising business at some point that works? Yes. Or a social network? Right? Yes. I, I'm, I'm, I don't think they've got the genetic support, but I'm not sure. I, you know, it's, even it, Apple's iTunes store it supports their hardware business. Yeah. Not well, the other way around. <laughs> That's their model. Hardware business yeah. works. Here's Robert, the problem. And, and I talked to the guys at Oakley about this. They predict that within a few years, every single product that you buy is going to be personalized. It's going to tell you stuff about you. They, they talk about having sunglasses with a little heads-up display that are going to tell you, oh, you should change the glasses, the lenses to this lens because that will give your experience a better experience. Everything's going to be personalized. So if Apple is going to compete in a hardware world where everything is personalized based on our behavior... They're going to need our, a profile system. They're going to need everything. If they yeah. don't have data about who we are, Google mm. does. And that's why the cloud Facebook is so some. important for them, the iCloud product line. Absolutely, and why yeah. they tried to get free of maps. maps why didn't you know, they... There's five things, why five haven't things they bought, in this world. Why haven't they bought Twitter? I mean, it just seems like the perfect purchase. Um... There's cultural, you know, Steve Jobs didn't understand Twitter and mm -hmm. didn't understand uh, social, you know. Um, yeah, but now you have he, Tim Cook is running the place, so shouldn't Tim know, but, just but, make but a run at it? Tim came out of Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs hired Tim, yeah. and those guys are not online. Right. You know, do you ever see Tim Cook out on Facebook or Twitter or Google Plus? No, or, he does, but I do see him on TV now, so maybe we're a step away. Kieran, last story. All right, so I think, Take a good uh, one. I think let's talk about... Um, you know, it's topical, the tech industry folks supporting um, gun control. Sort yeah, of sure. That's going well, on right we'll now. Yeah, talk about um, gun control, sure. Demand a plan. That's actually something that started over the summer in a reaction to the shooting in uh, Aurora, Colorado. Demand a plan. Demand I'm not aware plan. of what this is. So demand Tell a plan me. seeks a plan from Washington to end gun violence. They have a couple specific points. But the interesting thing is that this week they did a full page ad in the New York Times. With a lot of people's signatures on it. it included some Hollywood folks, but also a lot of tech people. So Michael Moritz. Fred Wilson, Mark Benioff, Ron Conway, Ev Williams, Dennis Crowley, Chris Dixon, Katerina Fake, 
Mike McHugh, Craig Newmark, David Tish, Hossein Rahman, Sarah Lacey. I mean, I, those are the ones that I picked out. Some of those folks also have put a demand to plan Twibbon um, on their Twitter profile pics. The homepage actually uses Rebel Mouse. We had Paul Berry of Rebel Mouse on the startup of the week earlier this week. So um, how else do you think the industry can be a force for change or good on this issue? Well, I'm just watching this video right here. I mean, look at who they got. It's oh, yeah. everybody. Yep. It's everybody. Carmelo. We do need to have a plan. I mean, it's getting ridiculous. I mean, if you, anybody who's got kids is particularly attuned to this issue after the last Friday, and it's terrible. What do you guys think? You're both parents. I've been arguing. My brother-in-law had sold guns. Uh, I, I, you know, so I, it's it's a family debate for me, and it it's not one that is winnable. I. Uh, just don't see our love of guns in our co country going down. I mean, I, this lady, uh, this mother, had guns in a house with a mentally disturbed child. Why the hell did she do that? Because there's such a deep love of guns in our country. And until we solve that, and she we're not going to write good laws. You can't solve that. You're you not going to solve, solve that. You can't solve that, right? It's a, it, it took, it, you know, but it there are things that can be done. I mean, well, it's, the problem is not guns. The problem is, is mental illness and lack of no, social services. Guns. The stats clearly show it's guns. It's but, both, right? I mean, it's got to be both. both. We have too many yeah. guns, and we have absolutely no These things no don't happen healthcare. in countries that don't have guns. Uh, yes, they do. The it same day, a, a wild, crazy guy used a knife on 20 kids in China, right? Mm -hmm. it, these things happen. <laughs> but the, See, the guns problem is, make I think, it so efficient to kill. Yeah. These are so efficient. I think Robert's exactly right. And, and, and Rafe, I think you're exactly right, too. Listen, let me put together the two positions of our, our guests. Rafe is right. This is a mental health, right? The guns don't kill people. The mentally ill people do. And then Robert's right. Like, Americans love these goddamn guns. Mm -hmm. And the guns are very too, are too powerful. And you put those two things together, it is a recipe for disaster. Let alone yeah. a parent who's got a kid who is living in the basement who's 20 years old. I mean... It's, it's a, it's, I, I really wish the mother was still alive so that we could learn something from what would possess a mother. I mean, I wish well, everybody was, was a, alive. She, but she, she believed that, uh, you know, there was going to be a war and, uh, you oh. know, she's a survivalist kind. My mom was in a cult with this kind, same kind of mentality. She didn't own a gun, but she was. They all believe it's the end of, of goddamn days. They have these guns that are just ridiculous. And she's got a mentally disturbed patient. She's got, you know, whatever, AR 15, 17. And, and obviously she didn't have them locked up because the kid got them. Well, so, I mean, a kid's going to be able to break into anything. I mean. No, you have. A, have you ever seen a gun lock? I, I, I have a gun and I'll I have a gun, gun lock. Yeah. Yeah, you have a gun lock. Can, can anybody break that gun lock? It would easily? take a lot of work. It would take a lot of work. You'd you have know, to have the a kids hacksaw. Are find the keys. My friends have yeah. gun safes. You yeah. are not going to break into that gun safe if if you ha have the yeah. key under control. Yeah. Right. Right. You have to have the key now, on you. If you leave the key in your house, so obviously the, the whole thing is broken. But here's something I, I want to throw out there. Yeah. I think with this problem, guns are not going away. Mental illness is got, not going away. What did happen at that school though that was interesting? The kids who got locked in a closet survived. Hmm. So maybe that's the answer. So get, come up with a cheap uh, closet of some kind that you can go into that's safe like rooms. bulletproof or safer, or just yeah. uh, you know give people a chance to survive in some some situation. Let like me tell you this. what happened. Maybe mm -hmm. that's. Uh, that's we still used to, thinking is think different, right? We think, we, okay, we have think, to we have to have a fresh discussion on this, and yeah. the kooks, and the people who are you know no no gun control people now have lost, and because this involved children, they've lost the argument. They don't have the high ground anymore, and they they can't defend their position. And we're going to see change. And it's going to come in the form, I predict, of an executive order. And the president's going to, and I don't know the exact laws around it, but you're going to have some executive orders to change this stuff. But we do need to have some creativity around this. I think what we should do is we should just offer, uh, we should just limit it to like one, like maybe one gun. Everybody can own one gun, obviously not these crazy, you know, powerful ones. But if everybody can own one gun at a time and the second gun is $1,000 and the third gun is well, $5,000 in tax a year, Jason, people can own I'm one gonna, gun. I'm going to go pro-gun on you. 
Go ahead. I believe I believe everything everybody should I believe we should have an Israeli or a Switzerland style society. But there's one catch. What's you that? have to join, you have to serve two years in the military. Oh, so you can have gun. a gun if you serve two years. Two oh, years. Oh, and in Switzerland, you have to keep a gun after you have do your mandatory service in the military, and it's kept, and there's you know, very few has of one. these because one by putting somebody through the military, they they get a uh, they 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 get attached to society in some deep way. Right, and. We can study and see if they're mentally ill, so we can it's keep a, it's a great idea. there. It's a great and idea. three, the gun is issued to you by the government, and it's it's a gun that holds, I think, uh, eleven bullets. Yeah, and is is not concealable. I've seen yeah. the Switzerland guns; they're big. You can't they're just rifle. walk around the street with one of those. You'll get a ta- attention. Right. Yeah. But it, it, something's got to change, and I think with the I good, don't want gun look, but that would not. I'm not sure that would fix the problem yeah. uh, in the school yeah. because I don't want guns in my kids' school. I want my insane. kids, Israel, they kids do but have I do guns. not want guns around my kids. Yeah, no. no in they, Israel, they do have guns. That the, they yes, have they do. trained I'm, teachers because they had yeah. they had a shooting of of this style in an Israeli school, and they t- trained teachers or, or administrators to have guns, and the problem stopped because uh, you know when you have a, a few people who are trained with with a good tr- uh, uh, gun, that'll. Take care. I do agree that there that there are other approaches to. Yeah. I, the, the good, the good news is we yeah, have to have an open. It's not going to work in our country. I, the the it's good that work. The, there's no good that can come out of 20 children being killed, but we do have a moral obligation to the memory of those children um, to do our best to um, to debate the issue yeah. and to make some changes. The, 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 this cannot the be. Nobody, this cannot be like the Aurora shooting where it's horrific for a week and then everybody forgets about it. This has to be, Newtown has to be the one where action occurs. The, the problem is, Jason, yeah. we, none of us are willing to change our position on this or a number of different issues. Uh, personally, uh, I don't know about that, Robert. Week. I think people are going to be very reasonable to the discussion. I think that what's happened I, is you've I been, tra- so. Robert, you've been trained to think that things can't change. But when you look at technology, you believe everything can change easily. Well, if people can switch it's, their goddamn social network, like they change the damn underwear, they can switch out their position on guns. If they can switch from MySpace to Facebook and to Instagram, they can switch from having 30 round clips to six. You, you can change. I, I used to be a very, very conservative Christian, and I'm yeah. not. I'm on the other side of. You're an atheist. Of those I understand. Uh, not an atheist. I'm an agnostic. I, right. I'm not sure that God doesn't exist, but I'm not sure He exists either, or yeah. she exists. Um, but I'm open to the possibility if she starts talking to me right now. Exactly. <laughs> Robert, um, you. It, it's me, I'm God, Robert. You, I you exist. Change. You have to yeah. switch to Vin, to Windows 8, Robert. It's me, God. That's easier than getting some a gun. You are a cruel and vengeful guy. guy. Change <laughs> <laughs> What's easier, getting people to give up their guns or getting people to give up their iPhones, Robert? Uh, e- easier to give them <laughs> get up, yeah, give up an iPhone. <laughs> really than a gun? Absolutely. I think it's if cultural. you listen, this is no, if I guns if we, are cultural. If if you I guns think are, go to I bet you the majority of gun owners if you said internet or guns you can only have one. Guns. They're going to oh, give well, up the gun. That, that, no, no, that's cultural. That, now you, you switched the question on me. <clears throat> I did. It, it, was, it was iPhone, give, give up iPhone, go with Windows phone. That's going to be easier than going from gun to no gun yeah. or internet to no internet. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, it, you know, I've been arguing with people online, including family members, and this is a very deep issue. It's not going to change fast. It, look at how, fa- how long it took uh, our uh, attitudes towards tobacco and smoking to change in our yeah. country. I think it's, that... I really think the president just has to do an executive order. The same way when 9-11 it's happened. It's ineffective, though. What's he going to do? I think he's got to just There's ban the... Outlaw the, sale of am, uh, outlaw the sale of guns that hold yeah, he's more than start nine like 20, rounds. Yeah, exactly. He's got to start buy, like 20... buy back or destroy the rest. I mean, exactly. Gotta, he's got to he start a buyback. He can't grandfather the old guns. Yeah. Gotta, he's got to do a buyback program. See, this is what I would do. Buyback program. You get 100% hey, of the cost of your work, gun man. if you sell it in it, the next year. You get 80%, I, then 60%, then 40%, then 20%. I and no more selling of the clips. 
He does an executive order. He gets tons of lawsuits from people, NRA, and it creates this massive gridlock and, and madness. But he, I don't know if he's going to do it or not. What do you think, Karen? I, I think, Let's hear Karen's point of view. I think that you guys are having the typical discussion that everyone yeah. has, and yeah. I actually really want you to have the discussion about how the stuff that you guys do every day, yeah. all the technology stuff, right. can actually be a force for good. That was my original question. Right. How can this be a force for good? Well, Beyond the usual, like, government has to do something, what else can happen through... Non-government stuff. Through well, look, technology. Okay, well, well, how about this? How about we do a Kickstarter what? campaign? I'll tell you something. If we did a Kickstarter campaign okay. to raise money for gun buybacks, that could happen outside the government, nah, it, and we could fund matter, the buyback, man. and we'll see yeah. how many people... I'll Jason. put a, I'll put up 500 bucks right Jason. now to buy back guns to destroy Jason. them. Sure. Jason, at Rackspace, we fit 18 people into a little uh, mini car, yeah. and the people who survived the shooting were in a closet... So that's the Silicon Valley kind of answer. In fact, SRI... Is a safe room? That's the best we can do? You no, we can come up with technology pr solutions to save lives. Mm. And by the way, we're going to have a far deeper problem How in about the next this? 30 years Actually, you know what, climate if you change and other issues here's than the technology. Here's a technology one. How about every gun that we sell going forward has to be hard-coded with a thumbprint reader on it, and you have to activate it by thumbprint. Now that's an, no, I this like guy, that this guy, these, these mass murderers are suicidal. They they kill a dozen people and they kill themselves. I know, but, but at least you know that the person has the the gun that they bought. No, I'm the, saying the gun problem, does not fire without a thumbprint recognition. Right. This problem. That, that's this second, problem that, for some reason that won't go. Yeah. You know, it's, well, it's privacy, be, government control won't fly. You know why? not why? just make because all the guns the gun radio controlled so the government has to authorize it before it will fire? It just won't work. The, the it's problem is the gun nuts think we're coming after their guns, so they're not going to be very likely to right. use, you know, uh, yeah. monitoring methods and stuff like that. But I, this is a technology problem that could be solved now that sensors are getting cheaper. Uh, you know, we have we have lots of technology that we could throw at the I, problem. I would like this. Is but, what I would like to see, if we, at the very least, we could we could throw this to a state by state issue. And I think there should be a referendum in every state. This may be something the president can do, is do a referendum where every state has to vote on exactly what gun control they want. We get an idea of what everybody wants. Do it online, like do it at the whitehouse.gov, where everybody gets to chime in and the votes are counted. And we actually see which states want to have bedlam and which ones don't. And then we can just say, you know what, California doesn't want to have this. We're going to really work hard on the legislature based on the internet voting. You know, like almost like, what do they call that when we have the... Um, the ballots, right? What do you call those ballots? Yeah, uh, the referendums. Referendums. We need a referendum on this. On a, you know, and you can pick what state you want to live in. If you want to live in the OK Corral, great, move to Texas. If you want to live in a gun-free zone, move to New York State or wherever. Uh, Jason, you're talking crazy. I am talking crazy. I know, listen, I'm, you're talking crazy. It's not going to happn so ah, the whole thing is find so, some way to, so to actually attack this problem in a new way. No, let's t uh, find a new way to you know, you what know, are we gonna, I, what are we gonna I, do? this is the SRI lab where the mouse was invented. They also do material research. They came up with bulletproof glass there. I I interviewed some of the scientists there. They are do, working on uh, bullet resistant materials that are lightweight and low cost. Yeah, yeah, to and put my daughter put in Kevlar to send her to school. That's you know what? Swear jar. If if it helps you survive, uh, helps one kid Robert. survive. That's better than trying to, you know, uh, put through a gun law that's not going to happen. Robert, you owe the swear jar ten dollars, by the way. And I'll take it off you next time I see you. I'm sorry. No, I just you know what I just I, I don't. This is really kind of sucks to end the whole year. You know, I had a 2012 with a great year for the industry, for the country. You know, individually I had a great year, and it's just like. To end the year on Newtown and to end the whole discussion on this is just, it's ultimately depressing and my heart goes out to those families and yep. I hope we come up with something. I mean, it it's really just feels like we definitely need to demand a plan and we definitely need to come up with some cr creative ideas. And the people in my audience, Jason? it's a good thing. If somebody comes up with a startup idea, it's a, well, I think some crowdfunding of the um, pulling guns out of the system could help actually. Or I do think we need to think about mental health being free because if you think about mental health all what if two-thirds of the people who are on the street who are homeless suffer from mental health it's some incredible amount put aside whether you think about what you think about obamacare or state-run health care can we all agree that mentally disturbed people should be able to get free health care i mean i think that's a pretty easy one for the majority of people to agree with that if people are and insane we put them it saves lives it, that's Not what i'm saying it's in our own best interest let, let me tell you, I have an autistic kid. He's five years old. His yeah. psychologist is saying yeah. he's going to need a private school, the, the really one that he really needs to be in. 50,000. 75,000. 
75000 a year. It's more than a Stanford education. It's unbelievable. You know, and it's just like... It's, it's expensive. And yeah. I don't know the, how I'm, I'm going to pay for it. So he's going to stay in public school where he's not getting the best help possible. We have to like, if, the, if it's really like this, so we're talking about such a small amount of money on a big, uh, when you share the, the pain of, you know, mental health, the burden, of, if we share the burden of the mental health cost across, you know, the wealth continuum, it would be pennies and dollars for us to take care of these people in society. If we cannot take care of the people who are the most vulnerable, the people who are suffering the most what kind of Jason, society are we the, living in? The other thing that happened in politics this week it was yeah. this uh, uh, financial cliff, fiscal cliff. Ugh. The Republicans can't even agree amongst themselves to raise taxes on yeah, the rich I, Yeah, I hate to make it a party-by-party party issue, but, you know, the Republicans... No, I, I'm not making a party thing. The Republicans themselves can't agree how to I, solve this problem. Well, this is because there's two Republican parties. There's the Republican Party driven by logic, and then there's a the Republican Party driven by absolute nutcases who are religious right-wingers, who the, the normal Republicans think that in order to get elected, they need to appease God-fearing maniacs who, you know, are, are just out there injecting God and all this madness into, you know, what the Founding Fathers wanted. And I hate to make this, a, you know, a God thing, but... You know, I tell you something, God didn't want those 20 kids to get killed, and, and God doesn't want the country to go bankrupt, and God doesn't want gridlock in, if you do believe in God, in, in Washington, and for God's sake, you got me all worked up now, it's a stupid issue. <laughs> that, this is, I, I'm telling you right now, when I retire, I'm starting, this is when I'm going to start a talk show, where I just be like Howard Stern every day, and do like drive time radio, and I'll just talk about these issues for an hour or two, because it's yeah. literally been making me mental. I watched Anderson Cooper read the names of those kids, I watched... I don't know about you guys. I've been obs I was obsessing about this for the last week, like watching every piece of media on it, and I am so depressed going into my vacation. Robert, how are you deeply impacted by this emotionally? Yeah, yeah, I, it's depressing because. Did you, you cry about it at it. all? Did you cry when you? When what? Hurt? Yeah. What about you, Rip? Did you cry about this at all at any point when you're watching the media or anything? I I couldn't. I was working here and it was like. You opted out. How can I get in, How can I get anything done? I was just like, I was thinking about my own kid who you know I'm down in Redwood City. He's in San Francisco. I'm, I'm an hour away from him. And, and what like, is he, seven or eight or something? I think you have an eight-year-old. six. Yeah. Six. The same age. And they locked the building down. You know, they locked, uh. he's in a school and they locked it all down and stuff like that, just like every other school around the country probably did. And it's like, this guy forced his way in. Yeah, you know, that's, no, the, that's the force of it. it you know, like every time it, it, it wasn't like he just, it wasn't like this guy just waltzed in. No, like he shot the, the windows days. out with the I know. Automatic rifle, a semi-automatic rifle. It's ridiculous. It's and ridiculous. by the way, so, so, there's this whole discussion of like semi-automatic versus automatic rifles, by the way. For anybody who's ever fired a gun, the difference is pa 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 versus brrrr. In other words, against people who are unarmed, there is no difference between semi-automatic and automatic if you're unarmed on the other side of the equation. The only yeah. difference, and even the, the, you know, the Navy SEALs, when they go into fighting situations, they're not on automatic. Automatic doesn't matter. It's the power of the rifle and the fact that as fast as you can hit the trigger, just ta 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 is as fast as you can fire. It makes no difference. So we're having this like farcical argument that it's automatic versus semi-automatic. No, it's the power of the goddamn rifle and the number of bullets in it and the metal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. do, you you gonna, yeah. do you want to end on a happy note, Jason? I do want to end on a happy note. Let's go you back to startups, man. Can you give me a cupcake or something? <laughs> I don't have a cupcake. Startups make me happy. They bring yeah. cool things to my life. All right, last, yeah. last thing. If it okay, happy, well, please. But I'm going to Hawaii tomorrow. I want to have something nice to think. I'm going on the beach. Ugh. Well, well, I think um, this is not news news, but you did get your Tesla bag. I got a Tesla bag. You're as right. a thank you for Signature Model S owners. Yes. And there was some some Model S love going on Twitter this week. And oh, yeah, Ev, definitely. Ev Williams called it, you know, an amazing best car ever. Correct. Kind of thing. And so... And so did Chris Saka. So did Chris Saka. Ev Williams so. and Chris Saka got theirs. Do you yeah. want to know the backstory? Sure. Here's the backstory. Um, there was a family gathering. Ev Williams is there. Chris Saka's there. I'm there with my family. I bring the car. I got the car three days earlier. I take those two guys for rides and their wives, and, we look, and they're just like going crazy over it. The wait's yeah. a year, right? But there are people who cancel once in a while, mm -hmm. who drop off the list. They had to buy another car, whatever. They, they had a divorce. They can't afford to pay for it. So once in a while, somebody drops off the list. So I said, if these guys are like, I got to get the car. You, you're good friends with the lawn. Can you get me up the list? I said, listen, I, you know, just if you really are serious about that, buy the car, put a full deposit down, send me your receipt, and I'll show it to a lawn, and I'll introduce you to him. They both send me the next day, Monday, they both send me, they bought 
the highest end everything. They sent it to me. I introduced them both to Alon. He and didn't, he didn't he, know them? He knew of them, oh. obviously. They know yeah. each other and whatever. Anyway, they, he moved them up the list, long ah. story short, yep. to a canceled slot. They got their cars and now they can't stop crowing about it. Now that gives me a huge problem because now everybody knows that I helped them get their cars and everybody thinks I can help now. And I got like 20 people and I'm like, I'm not sending a lot. This is the same problem I have with being friends with Mark Cuban. Everybody wants yeah. tickets to the Mavericks. Everybody wants a favor from Mark Cuban. And I'm like, not I can't happen. forward every request that somebody sends me nope. on to Mark Cuban. Don't ask me to move you up the list. Yeah. Come can on. you give me a it's ride? A I'll settle for that. I'm going to bring it's it a, to CES with me. I'm going to have a driver. It's a great car. In the it's car. a great car, man. I, uh, I'm bringing uh, it to CES. Jervitson, by the way, Jervitson lives about... Uh, yeah. He's got know. that crazy house Eight on the water. Down from my house. He's number yeah. one, right, on the list. Gee, yeah. he, all right, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Jervison. Oh. Let's get this right. <laughs> Let's get this right. Don't get it twisted. <laughs> Jervison has now number one up. <laughs> of the Founder Series, which is 30 cars they made for the people who invested in the company. The first one made available to the public, signature model number 00001, belongs to Jason Calcanis. Uh, Don't get it twisted. I could have had a founder series. I elected to get the number one. I wouldn't have had the number one. Jervison got that. So Jervison yeah. got his a month before me. He, he has an earlier model. But I have the first one ever available to the public. Signature model number one, 00001, serial number. Boy, Jason, you're going to be so pissed when uh, Tesla does an Apple and upgrades, and you're like, I just got mine six months ago. You know what? Four times that's happened, and they did an over-the-air upgrade, and I got the whole software rebooted. It, your car goes into lockdown mode for an hour. It downloads. What, what happens if you're driving? No, you can't do it. Okay. You basically have to be home. You have to plug it in, just like you do when you're upgrading your firmware on your laptop. It's like, be plugged into the power. Yeah. Be in, so okay. when, you, when you do the over-the-air upgrade, you have to be in park. You have to be plugged in. So something like that can't happen. All right, yep. All right listen. It's Robert, a great car, by the way. I, that, I got to drive number six <clears> of the founder's car. So I'm going to bring the car to, I'm going to bring Bryce with me to CES. He's going to be my driver. Because I just realized that CES, you can't get a driver, even if you're willing to pay a thousand or two thousand dollars a day. And as Robert and Rafe will tell you, CES is an incredible disaster getting around, right? Yeah, not going this year. Right, exactly. I'm, and so I'm, I'm going, going after is, a three. I'm going after a three-year break. You going, Robert? Actually, we're doing. So uh, you know, I have I have the working man's Tesla called a Prius. Yeah. <laughs> and Ford is giving us a, a, a C Max, a new oh, cool. hybrid car. Awesome. Uh, to compare the Prius against the the oh, awesome. C Max. So uh, uh, is Rackspace going to have a big uh, presence at uh, CES? Are you going to have a party, uh, a blog uh, lounge, or anything? Uh, no, I'm at, oh, yes, we are, at, at New Media Expo. Okay, uh, great. We have a booth at the New Media Expo, not at CES. Cause well, Rackspace is obviously a great meetings. company, and, and I'd like to thank Rackspace for providing great service to so many people out there. I know a lot of my fans use Rackspace, and I know um, Rackspace makes, in, ter in terms of making independent media possible, Robert's entire existence at this point is thanks to Rackspace underwriting uh, you know, the great content he makes for startups every day. So I just want to, you know, if you're listening and you're a fan of Robert's work or him being on the show, just say thank you at Rackspace. It's a great company, world-class company. Um, we're we're uh, more open than the other guys. We're on OpenStack. OpenStack was just chosen by CERN, by the way. So Oh, great. Yeah, they, they have OpenStack, and it's cloud-based and awesome. So thank you. And hey, Evernote, obviously, is the greatest product ever known to man. Everybody's addicted to it here at uh, MahaloInside.com this weekend, every company. Um, and everybody loves Evernote, and the new food app is out. What is it called? Food Note? Just Evernote Food. Evernote also, food. try help. Try hello for recording the interactions, the meetings you have with people. Oh, cool. It's, uh, it's one of my favorite uh, little unknown features or, or products that, that Evernote makes. Yeah, and everybody follow at Rafe. Everybody follow at Scobalizer. Thank you to my friends at Snap Terms for making great products. Thank you to... New Relic. New Relic at New Relic. Real user experiences. Code level app performance. Server response. Awesome. Hey, Kieran. Thanks for... Uh, it's your first full year here. It's wonderful... You were I've here been for here half a year. Two years. No, but dude. you were here for a half year uh, last year before that? I started December 9th, 2010. Oh, was it December? That was January. Okay. If anybody's well, listen, keeping hey, track, that is two years, my friend. Listen, you've done an amazing job. Well mm -hmm. done. The show this week in startups, some people were wondering, hey, how's it going so well? You're getting such great guests. If you want to know the answer, Kieran has been taking over booking the guests, and the guest level is getting to another level. Last week on the news, we had David Cohen and Kara Swisher. We had Peter Cara. Diamandis. We had Peter Diamandis on. We had Jeff Clavier on. And now this week, Rafe and Robert Scoble. So you're doing a great job. I'm well trying. done. Have a great break. You earned it. Thank you. And the launch ticker doing fabulous. And thank you to Brandis, uh, making really good things I happen. I should hire her. Who would you like to hire, Kieran? Yeah. 
Be careful, Robert, okay? <laughs> Everybody thank Robert for his last appearance on the show. <laughs> no post hey rule. Hey, now. Uh, and Robert's going to join us at uh, the launch festival, yes? Oh, of course yes. he is. Yeah, okay. Of course, of course. Right. And the launch festival is going to be amazing this year. Um, we've got an amazing, amazing... Um, uh, we're going to do three days this year. We're already, I think we're already at like maybe $350,000 in sponsorship, which is further along than we've ever been. We've got to get to like six fifty dollars or so, which we'll get to, I think, pretty confidently. We gave 1,000 tickets away to developers and UX professionals. They took us up on it. We checked their LinkedIn to make sure they're actually real builders. Then we gave another 1,000 away. There's going to be 5,000 people there, Robert, because I don't need to make a profit off of this, unlike other conferences. We're going to have 2,000 seats this year in the auditorium. It's going to be insane. I'm, are, I'm going are you going to bring tequila to the press again? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm going to have VI, <laughs> yes, the VIP waiter service will be there again. You email VIP at launch.co, I, and we bring to your seat number. I noticed this is a number. trend. Uh, uh, Loeb, uh, Loic, uh, you know, took us to some awesome wine. We had Palmer wine, which is about $300 a bottle. And, oh, and he every, brought to your desks? Well, he at took the us event, to or you just blah, which was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll have wines so. in the afternoon. So anyway, it's going to be amazing. And we just announced today that we're going to have a hackathon That's right. on uh, I'm Saturday. I'm super psyched about that. i got to say that, by the way. Yeah, um, we'll be great. Maybe Evernote can put up a prize or something or buy lunch or something. Uh, if you we'll guys talk. To it. Uh, yeah, it would be cool. Yeah, and you should definitely come. So the hackathon, we're going to have, um, uh, I think, probably 50 teams of four. Uh, we're going to limit it to 250 people. But the exciting news is I decided I'll just invest $25,000 in whoever the winner is and join their board. So I'll like literally take an initiative then the top five people from the hackathon out of 50, which means 10% of the people who present at the hackathon, will make it to the main stage, and we're going to have a new award. It's going to be called the Launch Alpha. So we have Launch 1.0, brand new company, first time anybody's ever seen the product. Launch 2.0 is a new product from an existing company or a pivot. Yeah. But now we have the beginning of the life cycle, which is the Launch Alpha, which is something that was just made in the last 48 hours. I'll in personally invest 25000 and join the board of the company and work with them over the next two or three years. The five people who get on stage automatically get a slot in the 2014 competition for that product or another one, as long as it's the same team. So what we're doing here is, if they make it through the, not only do you get $25,000 investment if you're the winner, you get to um, then. You'll have money to build it, first of all. You have money, but then you'll be able to go to VCs and angels and say, we, we were in we the top 10%. We have a guaranteed spot on stage in front of 2,000 people. So I'm just pulling out all the stops on this one. And I basically said to myself, I'm getting bored. Well, you know, I tell you, we had this You discussion. get bored easily. I, <coughs> I do. <coughs> I get a little bit bored. I get a, and I just like, I'm a, new, I'm a junkie when it comes to trying to get a rush out of something. And so I want a little bit more of a rush out of the event. So I said, you know what? F it. We're going to three days. We're doing the hackathon. I'm going to put $250,000 at risk. If I don't get those sponsors, I lose it. But I need to have some skin in the game here. And you know what? It's working out. We got these great sponsors, Sequoia, Google, Bing, Wilson Sensini. Maybe you've heard of some of these people. MailChimp. MailChimp. <laughs> we should talk to Rackspace. Is going to have some news. Listen, I have I, 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 uh, I owe Rackspace some love, as you know, Robert, on the back end tip. And so mm -hmm. I'm willing to eat crow and do whatever it takes to um, show my love for Rackspace because we've had a little bit of a rocky thing in the past. Mm. We'll leave that off the table mm. for now, but I, I got to show some yeah. love to my friends at Rockspace. Uh, we're thinking of an, uh, of an incubator in San Francisco, so it'd be oh, fun to talk about that. That'd be great. Maybe you could launch it on stage and I could interview the CEO or of Rockspace. Co-working space. Genius. <laughs> great idea. All right. Oh. Listen, everybody. It's great space, right? It's second and Folsom. So. Awesome. Hey, um, right. thanks again to everybody who made this year and this week in startups, including the fans, uh, a very successful one. Thing, Jason. What's that? Jason. Uh, we talked about that Apple uh, uh, Kickstarter thing. Yeah. There's news breaking right now. Apple answered the concerns and said it's not our fault. And they it, now it's a he said, she said kind of thing. So oh, good. Up on, up on VentureBeat, there's an answer from <laughs> Apple. So which, I just wanted to correct that. Which shows you the Apple people uh, need to get another lesson in PR. Never fight down. Never fight down. They shouldn't have said anything. They shouldn't have responded. Silence is golden. Nobody would have even thought about this. Now, this becomes the top story on tech meme again. So dumb. Never respond. Learn your lesson. Hey, anyway, I'm trying to wrap up here. <laughs> We're gonna what an it. amazing 2012 it's been. What an amazing 2013 it will be. It's been so great to have all these great guests for the year. Saka and Peter Diamantis. Naval. And Naval. Chamath. Chamath. And so many great people. David Sachs was on the program again. Or, uh, Dave Goldberg. I just want to thank everybody for coming on the program. I want to thank the audience most of all. 
for tuning in week after week, for harassing the people who haven't been on the show, for yelling at the people who have been on the show. I saw you on the show. I saw you on the show. This is what I need you maniacs to do. You have to be the super fans that you are. And that means you have to sometimes put yourself out on a limb. And when you meet somebody famous, say, why haven't you been on This Week in Startups? Why haven't you been on This Week in Startups? Like a mental patient. And you need to thank people for being on the program. You need to thank the sponsors for supporting it. And you have. And that's why the show's leveled up. It leveled up in 2012. And you guys recharged me. And now I'm ready to go into 2013 and do another full year of the show. 2014, absolutely not. I'm announcing it right now. I'm done in 2014. 2014, end of the show. Done. But I'm doing 2013, so everybody's got 52 weeks. About 100 more episodes. You got about 100 more episodes. That's, the, that's all you're taking out of me. But it's going to be a great 2013. I'm predicting it's going to be the best 2013 ever. And, uh, <laughs> and now you're going to go lie on the beach. And now I will go <laughs> to Maui. And you know who's watching my house and my dogs? Who? Josh Harris. We live in public. Oh, my God. That's not a good idea, is it? It is. Yeah. got to Got to watch the Hacienda. I have more, I just realized, like, I've got more, i got, like, two people staying at my house when I'm gone. For those people who want to rob my house when I'm gone, I have two people staying at my house. And a bunch of firearms. So stay out of this, speaking of firearms. You just don't want Josh to recreate We Live in Public in your In house. my house, exactly. I've got, I've got seven cameras at my house, and I do own a firearm, which I'm, like, thinking, of. I mean, the only reason, I own a firearm because I have specific threats, I've had threats before, and so i got to think about these things, but... Now I'm starting to think, God, what am I doing with the firearm? And the, I got armed security response. I got everything at the compound, but whatever. Anyway, listen, it's going to be a great 2013. Everybody enjoy the break. We'll see you next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye. Ray from Robertson.